So let's meet tonight's presenter. Dr. James Claypool has over 38 years of teaching and administrative service in Kentucky education. A founding father of Northern Kentucky State College, now university, he began the athletic program there, was the first to offer full scholarships to female, female athletes in the South, helped establish the Presidential Scholars Scholarships and Paul Sipes Award, established the university archives and helped form the university's honors program. Claypool has served as a media resource on the history of Kentucky and the Kentucky Derby. He has done numerous local radio and television programs and appearances and is a nationally recognized expert and speaker on the Kentucky Derby. He wrote the lyrics for Sunrise at the Downs, a song about the Kentucky Derby on the 2008 album, Return to Baptist Alleyway by Dan Knowles. He is a member of three Hall of Fames, including the Kentucky Veterans Hall of Fame, the Northern Kentucky University Athletic Hall of Fame, and the Northern Kentucky Athletic Hall, Northern Kentucky Athletic Hall of Fame. He has won numerous awards, including the Kenton County Pioneer Award and Distinguished Alumnus of Center College. Now, before we get started, there is a quiz question tonight. The first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or Facebook Live wins the Northern Kentucky History Hour prize, and most importantly, bragging, bragging rights. Tonight's question is, who named Secretariat? So go ahead and get those guesses in the chat, please. And Dr. Playful, Dr. Claypool, if you are ready, we can go ahead and get started. Well, I certainly am ready. Before I start, though, I want to thank Joe Brennan and uh, Jason French for sitting over here and giving me moral support. They may also uh, distract me, but that'll be all right. <laughs> this we is not the first time I've done a talk on Kentucky. As a matter of fact, uh, on Kentucky racing, this will probably be my 300th time. But uh, this is a little different because normally I talk about the Derby exclusively. I'm going to talk about racing in general uh, tonight. Uh, and run it all the way through the decades uh, and centuries of Kentucky history. Uh, I want to start by reading something, and this was written by a man by the name of Bill Corum. Bill Corum was a famous journalist, a sports announcer. He was one of the first uh, announcers for the Kentucky Derby. In 1925, he and Clem McCartney called the first Kentucky Derby on radio. Bill then evolved into the publicity director of Churchill Downs, and on the death of uh, Matt Wynn in 1949, <clears throat> Bill became the president of Churchill Downs and remained so until his death in 1958. Bill was a very literate, well-educated, and articulate man. And he once wrote this, and I think this kind of encapsulates what thoroughbred racing is all about in Kentucky. He wrote, and he based this, incidentally, on Caesar's commentaries on the Gaelic Wars. Some of you may remember studying that. That was the basic book for Latin in which all Gaul was divided into three parts, but actually it was only two, but who cares? He wrote this, as far as horses are concerned, all mankind may be divided into three parts. One third is indifferent to horses because it doesn't know any better. Another third is afraid of horses because it doesn't know any better. The final third does know better and thinks that man's noblest friend should be bred and raced into a splendid golden immortality far removed from the wayward cousin that the kids ride. And I think that gives you an idea of what racing and what thoroughbred racing is all about. Let's define thoroughbred racing to start out. For a horse to be a thoroughbred horse and race on thoroughbred racing tracks anywhere, he or she must be directly descended from three Arabian stallions if they are not able to trace their lineage directly back to these three stallions, and that'd be 30, 40, 50 generations, whatever it might happen to be, they are not a thoroughbred. And those three Arabian stallions are the Darley Arabian, the Godolphin Barb, and the Byerly Turk. And each one of them has an interesting story. The Darley, and incidentally, 90% of all the horses that race today on racetracks are Darleys. That's the dominant strain. Darley was uh, a man who was adventuresome and decided to buy a stallion from the sheik to send over to his brother. Well, the sheik didn't want to really sell the stallion, and they had to sneak it out of Arabia to get it to England, so that's how it got there. The Godolphin Barb is a totally different story. The Godolphin Barb was a gift to Louis 
the 15th, the king of France. He was a terrible actor, nasty, nasty horse. And the king said, get him out of my stable. He disappeared. And there was an Englishman, a lord by the name of Cook, who happened to be in Paris one day and saw this horse drawing a water cart, cart pulling a water cart, and recognized this as an Arabian stallion, bought him and sent him over to England. About 8% of all thoroughbreds are directly related to this particular line, including man of war. The third line, the Byerly Turk, is even more interesting in a lot of different ways. It was a horse that was captured in war in Arabia, sent back to England, and became a war horse. As some of you may remember, uh, Charles the uh, Second passed the throne in England onto his brother, James the Second, who nobody liked, and they eventually brought over William and Mary. Mary was the daughter of James the Second, and it was called the Glorious Revolution. That led to a war called King William's War, and this horse actually was ridden into battle two different times by a lord in England as a war horse, so it's known as the war horse. Now, racing. We trace our roots in racing back to England. Many, many of the things that tied to racing are tied to the English heritage. Formal racing in England began in the 1660s when England restored Charles II to the throne. Charlie had a blank check. He could do anything he wanted to do, and what he wanted to do was have a lot of fun. So he brought his friends with him and his horses with him, and they began to race horses. And in those days, we're not racing six furlongs, which is three quarters of a mile. We're racing heat races at the distances of three or four or five miles each heat, and a horse might be required to run five heats to determine a winner. So a horse might be required to race 25 miles in a given day. Needless to say, they didn't race very fast. Charlie was having a good time. He brought his friends. And one of them said, my horse is faster than yours. Imagine that. Imagine someone saying their horse was faster than his. And of course, the response to that is, you want to bet? And of course, they did. And so they bet. But in those days, gentlemen did not exchange money between one another. Somebody had to hold it. Somebody had to keep a record of the bet. And that person was the bookmaker, as in bookies, as we well know. As time passed, too, the gentlemen decided to show off a little bit and bring their girlfriends and aunts and wives and whatnots to the races. And they arrived there in coaches. And as they got off, and they said, whose horse is that? The men knew whose horse it was, but the women didn't. So the women said, well, we came in coaches. The coachmen had colors. Let's put colors on the jockeys. And that's where the jockey suits came from. In addition to that, they said, you can't just hand money to somebody. You got to have a fancy silk sewn purse. And so they began to offer purses, purses. And they were racing on the grass the opposite way we race here in America, of course. And that all influenced the later racing in America. The first race course in America was laid out on Long Island by Governor Nichols. And soon it spread all over the colonies. All the people of wealth and interest were involved in racing in American history. And that included George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and the list is just endless. And they were racing. And I know that you're going to find this hard to believe, but before long, there were match races because the North said, our horses are faster than the South. Imagine that. And someone said, no, our horses are faster than the South. And so they had many famous match races in those days. But we did not get to thoroughbred racing until 1730. In 1730, a horse by the name of Bull Rock, B-U-L-L-E, Rock, came to America, to Virginia. And that's terribly significant to Kentuckians because we came from Virginia. Tennessee came from North Carolina, but Kentucky came from Virginia. And as these pioneers moved into Kentucky, they brought their horses with them. And they discovered an amazing thing. Here in Kentucky is the best place on the planet to raise horses. They are stronger. They are faster, i.e., 115 of the 149 Kentucky Derby winners are Kentucky breds. And there was another one who should have been a Kentucky bred by the name of Secretariat. He was bred in Kentucky, but he was foaled in Virginia. We'll get to him later. And so we discovered why. And the reason is 
the limestone water of Kentucky seeps up into the grasses, into the bluegrass of Kentucky, and our horses become stronger and faster because of that. The first racing in Kentucky, organized racing, and there'd been racing from the forts. There's an instance in which one guy rode out and an Indian shot him, but that's another story. And the bottom line is we began to race formally in 1787, and of all places, imagine this, the heart of the bluegrass is a place called Lexington. Lexington, Kentucky. And at first they raced in the streets of Lexington, but the good citizens, as they grew more cultured, said, move that out of town. So they moved the track out of town. And ultimately, they would form an association of horsemen in 1828 and form a track there called the Association Track. And so as far as the South was concerned, the center of racing was in Lexington, Kentucky at the Association Track. Later, in a place called Louisville, and I know you won't believe this, but there is a rivalry between Louisville and Lexington. Yes, there is. Later in 1859, prior to the Civil War, they founded a track in Louisville that was called Woodland Racecourse. It lasted until 1870, but the important thing of it was they awarded a trophy in 1859 and 60 and 61 for the winner of their top stakes race. And the name of this trophy was the Woodland Vase or the Woodland Vase. Today, that is the trophy that is awarded at the Preakness because it went through many permutations, but ended up at Pimlico in Baltimore, Maryland. So the actual trophy of the races held in Louisville was the Woodland Vase. Then the Civil War took place. And in Kentucky, the story of the Civil War was horse thieves. Horse thieves from the east and north and south and west coming in here, raiding our thoroughbred race farms, trying to get the stallions, trying to get in the best horses. And there was a war going on between the owners and the raiders. And what the owners often did was to hide their horses in various places or even paint them a different color. So that was part of the game that was being played. During the Civil War, it is estimated that one million horses died. One million horses died. Now, let's talk a little bit before I get to the history of the Kentucky Derby and some other racetracks. Let's talk a little bit about what racing means in Kentucky. Racing is a $6.5 billion industry in Kentucky. It affects over 200,000 people. There are 18,600 thoroughbreds bred in the United States, and of those, 63.7% are Kentucky breads. So that gives you kind of an idea of how we stand. If you draw a map of the United States, and based it on thoroughbred production, Kentucky would dominate half of the United States. That will give you an idea of what I'm talking about there. And so over 200,000 people involved, many racetracks, and a culture and a heritage that we are very, very proud of. You go to Lexington, and they beat you to death with horses. That's just automatic in Lexington and some other cities as well. But let's get now to the story of the Kentucky Derby. And there have been many racetracks in Kentucky. Uh, I'll talk about a few other ones as we go along here. But there was a man by the name of William Merriweather Clark. Or was it Lewis Merriweather Clark? Yes, it was. Some people called him William, but his real name was Lewis Merriweather Clark. Who was he? The reason they call him William was because of his grandfather. His grandfather's, of course, was the Lewis Clark Expedition, the famous explorer. And so he was the namesake of William and Clark, William Clark and Lewis, Meriwether Lewis. And so he came from money, a lot of money, but his mother and father died and he became an orphan about 1870. And he was taken in by his uncles, his uncles, Lewis and Randolph Churchill. And they had a little farm outside of Louisville, a little bitty farm outside of Louisville. And so Mr. Clark, who was married, decided to go to Europe, and he wanted to study thoroughbred racing in Europe, and he wanted to see what was going on there. He went to France, and he, I know you're not going to believe this, he discovered that they were fixing races in France. The bookies were fixing races, and so the French, to counteract this, had created a system of betting called the Perry Mutual System, in which all the monies are pooled 
certain amount goes to the entity which sponsors the race and the rest of it's divided up between the winners. Okay. And he discovered then he needed to go to England because there were three great races being run in England at this time. There was the St. Ledger, which was the oldest. There was the Epsom Oaks and there was the Epsom Derby. The Epsom Derby, which incidentally is run at one foot longer than the current Kentucky Derby, one foot. How did the Epsom Derby come about? Well, England had formed a jockey club to regulate racing. And there were co-presidents of the jockey club. One was Lord Darby, and the other was Lord Bunbury. And now they have to name this race that they're going to run. So they flipped a shilling, and unfortunately for all mankind, Lord Darby won, because otherwise we would be running the 150th Kentucky Bunbury. But that's another story, of course, too. And so Clark studied very carefully, and he came back. And he sold shares in an enterprise. How old would you like to have had a, one of those shares at $100 a share? He sold 5,000 shares. And they built a racetrack on the farm that he grew up on, the Churchill Farm. And, of course, that was first known as the Louisville Jockey Club and then eventually Louisville Downs. And they prepared now to run the Derby. But I want to illustrate how much racing and horses mean to us. Every Christmas, I receive a Christmas card from somebody involved in racing. Here's one of them. Notice the horses and notice the Christmas wreath. And another one, a second card. That's the way horses ought to act during the winter time. And at one time, of course, in Kentucky, we had a license plate. Had a license plate that reflected, we will see this, we'll come to that. We had a license plate that reflected our heritage. Notice that license plate. It has two twin spires. We know where that came from, Churchill Downs. And this was our license plate for many years. And then some rocket scientist down in Frankfurt decided that wasn't a very good plate, so we ought to have this plate, the smiley face. Well, needless to say, that was not very popular. But Kentucky is not stupid. Kentucky knows a good thing when they have it. And so now you can buy a vanity license plate for $60, which has a horse on it, which, of course, my wife has and I can't afford. But that's another story, too. And so we got ready to run what was basically going to be three races at this new race course, Churchill Downs, as it came to be known. We were going to run the Clark Handicap, which was really a copy of the uh, uh, earlier race that he had seen, and the Oaks and the Derby. And so... Here we are, May 17th, 1875, a Monday. Did I say that right? Yes, I did say that right. And we're going to run this race at a mile and a half. And it's going to be only for three-year-olds. And they would actually run the Derby every day of the week at one time or another. Today, of course, we run the Derby the first Saturday in May. And that, for all Kentuckians and much of the world, is an official holiday. And, of course, when they play My Old Kentucky Home, and when those horses come out onto the track, everybody for one and a half minutes becomes a Kentuckian. And the first time they ever played My Old Kentucky Home was in 1921, 1921. And it was the run for the roses. And where did that come from? Well, it came from our old friend Bill Corum. He coined the phrase run for the roses. Up until then, they had been running for carnations, gladiolas, petunias, or whatever but it became the run for the roses in 1921. And in 1928, the Kentucky legislature in its infinite wisdom made my old Kentucky home, the official song of the Kentucky Derby. And so they ran that first Derby. Everybody knew who was gonna win that Derby. Of course, in horse racing, everybody knows who's gonna win the race. We know that for sure. Everybody knew that the winner was going to be a horse called Chesapeake. And Chesapeake was from Lexington, Kentucky. He was owned by a man by the name of H.P. McGrath. McGrathiana was the farm there in Lexington. And he was the best three-year-old in the nation, maybe in North America and South America, for that matter. The problem was this. Chesapeake had a bad habit. And that habit was he just loved to run with other horses. And so he'd get in a race and just lope along 
with the other horses and eventually maybe take a notion and sprint ahead and win the race. Well, that doesn't suit very well for a person to become a derby winner. And so to correct this, Mr. McGrath bought another horse, a horse that had never won a race, a maiden. And this horse is to be the rabbit in the race. Most of you know that in track and field events, you get somebody to run out real fast, set a fast pace and sets the race up for the best runner in the race. Well, that was the idea. This horse would run as fast as he could, wear the other horses out. Then Chesapeake would take an ocean, run ahead of him, win the first Kentucky Derby. There were 10,000 people present there at the first Kentucky Derby, a big event, including a man by the name of Matt Wynn, who stood on his grandfather's buckboard and watched this race and had enough sense, the only person on this planet that had enough sense to save the program. That program is in the Kentucky Derby Museum now. There is exactly one of them. Now, audience, if you go up in the attic and find a Kentucky Derby program from 1875, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, go on. Do not call eBay. Call me. I'll help you. We'll be profiting greatly from that. There is only one 1875 program, and it's in the Derby Museum. And incidentally, the Derby Museum, which of course is uh, located right next to Churchill Downs, was created and governed and overseen by Stanley Hugenberg, who was a Northern Kentucky, who lived in Northern Kentucky and, and who was an executive vice president there at the museum. Incidentally, we're going to have a display April, uh, let's see, Six. April what? Six. April 6th, that is going to feature people with connections to Northern Kentucky and the Kentucky Derby. And Stanley Hugenberg is one of those, and there's several others. And I'm going to spoil it for you. You just have to come and see it. But we've got some wonderful things, some from my collection, but some from other collections that are really fantastic. So when this opens, be sure and come and see it. Now, back to the race. The race was run. McGrath was in the infield. The owner was in the infield. He was the only man in the infield that race. Can you imagine that? Today, you might see 40,000 people, some of which are sober, in the infield, watching that race and cheering. Sometimes they look at the race and sometimes they don't get around to that. But he was there. And as they came around the stretch, a jockey by the name of Ollie Lewis, Ollie Lewis was riding the rabbit. And the rabbit was six lengths ahead. And McGrath yelled, Ollie, Ollie, go ahead and win it. You can win it. Go ahead and win it. And he did. The rabbit had not been told that he was supposed to stop. And he went on to win the first Kentucky Derby. Here's a picture of him. Go back. No, we're we'll good. Yeah. His name was Aristides or Aristides. And that little black colt became the first Kentucky Derby winner and went into immortality because of it. And what an exciting event. And of course, now everybody was interested in the Kentucky Derby. People flocked to it. No, they didn't. Nobody paid a whole lot of attention to it, truthfully, other than the people from Tennessee and Kentucky. There were several Tennessee horses entered in that race because racing between Tennessee and Kentucky in this era was a real rivalry. And Tennessee held its own. They won three derbies with Tennessee breads. And it remained that way until the people down in Tennessee decided it was illegal to bet on races in their state. And so they went a different direction, the Tennessee walking horse and some whiskey. But that's another story as well. And so nobody paid a whole lot of attention. There were bigger races, much bigger races at much more important racetracks in America, whether it be Saratoga or whether it be uh, uh, Belmont or any one of a number of racetracks. And so the Derby was run. And it was primarily a match race between the best of Tennessee and the best of Kentucky. And because of that, it floundered a bit. It never made a lot of money, and Clark kept pouring money into it, kept pouring money into it to a point where he finally had to sell the track. And who did he sell it to? Some Louisville gamblers, of course, who wanted to get the track so they could fix races, use bookies and fix races. That was not uncommon for 
bookies to own horses. People didn't know that, and their horses to win, and they keep the odds accordingly. So in 1896, having sold the track, having ballooned from a weight of about 158 to 60 to over 300 pounds, probably eating because of depression, some say, maybe not. He was in a love, uh, it was in a Nashville hotel. He took a revolver and shot himself in the head and died. And that's the end of the story. No, no, it isn't. I'm just kidding. What happened after that was Churchill Downs continued to struggle. In the meantime, they had found a track in a place called Northern Kentucky. And this track turned out to be much more important than Churchill Downs in this era. This track would lead the nation 10 times in the size of purses, would produce all kinds of famous horses, set all kinds of track records. And it was founded right down here in Latonia. It was named after the Latin Springs of Northern Kentucky. And it opened in 1883. Interestingly, in 1883, to show you the possibilities of this new Latonia track, which is now known as Old Latonia, they sent horses up here to run in the Primo race. A horse by the name of Hindu had won the Kentucky Derby three years before. And so they ran their first stakes race as the Hindu stakes. And three horses came up here that had run in the Kentucky Derby. And guess what? They ran exactly up here as they had in the Kentucky Derby with a horse by the name of Leonidas winning both races. Leonidas had been ridden in Churchill, at Churchill Downs by a 16-year-old who was the name O'Donohue, they shortened it to Donahue. And because he bet on the race and they found out he bet on the race, he was disqualified from racing and never raced as a rider ever again. But the track was off to a running start here at Latonia. And before long, the Hindu stakes was renamed the Latonia Derby. And the Latonia Derby was more prestigious than the Kentucky Derby for many, many years. Meantime, Many people were complaining about the distance of the Derby. And in 1896, they shortened it from a mile and a half to a mile and a quarter with the theory that young horses shouldn't run a mile and a half at an early age. And so it looked like it could go either way for Churchill Downs. But it was going to go a different way in every respect. Now, how did it change? Remember that fellow that had the program standing on the buckboard? Matt Wynn? We've got a picture of Matt here somewhere. Keep going. There he is, Matt Wynn. He was a tailor in Louisville, but he had always been fascinated with racing. And they persuaded him to get involved with Churchill Downs, which he did. And he started at a certain level, but ultimately became the man that ran Churchill Downs, the man that made the Kentucky Derby, because he was the P.T. Barnum of Kentucky racing. He dedicated his life, his entire energies to making the Kentucky Derby the greatest race on the planet, which it is, of course. And we're going to run the 150th Kentucky Derby. I can't imagine what's going to go on that infield on the 150th Derby. We'll see. Time will tell on that. Matt spent the next 13 years, next 13 years, traveling all over the United States and getting himself involved in several racetracks, holding interest in these racetracks, and trying to every get everybody involved with the Kentucky Derby. He would go and throw parties and tell everybody how great the Kentucky Derby was. And, of course, he often plied his pitch with something known as Kentucky bourbon. And a lot of people got drunk at masks parties. A lot of people. And finally, in 1915, he was up in New York having a party. And a fellow who was in his cups, drunk, came over and said, Matt, Matt, Matt. He said, all you do is talk about that Kentucky Derby of yours. And I tell you what, you've never had a Philly. Never had a Philly win that Kentucky Derby. And I've got a nice Philly up here in New York. And I'm going to send her down to your Derby. The year was 1915. And the man's name that was talking to Matt was Harry Payne Whitley, just the most famous horseman on the planet. And Matt's eyes lit up, his mind rolled, and he said, Harry, could you get a couple of the other boys to come down too? Because in Matt's mind was, if 
this regret could win this Derby and the two other New York horses could run two and three in the Derby, the Derby's history would be made. The press would go nuts and everybody would live happily ever after. That was the plan. It's the only time he ever rooted against Kentucky Breads, but that particular race he did. 1915, the race is about to be run. Three weeks before the race is to be run, something happened that almost upset the entire apple cart. What happened? They sank the Lusitania with the loss of over a thousand people, many of whom had dual American and English citizenship. Now, let me tell you, folks. You're about to get on the Lusitania, and you get a copy of the New York Times. The entire front page was purchased by the German embassy, and it said, do not board this ship. It's carrying war munitions. Now, I don't know about you. I think I'd have turned my ticket in, and it also said, we're going to sink it. They almost didn't sink it. It eluded German submarines until off the Irish coast, a German sub put a torpedo in it, and sunk it. And it looked like we were going to war. And the Kentucky Derby was irrelevant at that point. But, but, we had a president by the name of Woodrow Wilson. And he had campaigned on the campaign, I will not take you to war. America wasn't ready for war. America was ready to have fun, to make money, do the things Americans do. And they were looking for an outlet something to get their mind off of. Of course, we didn't go to war at that particular point. We would eventually, but we didn't at that point. And so the Kentucky Derby was going to provide that outlet that we focus now on World Series and Super Bowls and things like that. Remember the origin of the Super Bowl? Nobody cared much about the Super Bowl. You could have got a Super Bowl ticket for $35. Try to get that now. But anyway, they were going to run this race, the 1915 Kentucky Derby. And guess what? Just exactly as Matt Wynn had predicted and planned, the New York horses ran one, two, three, with regret the Philly winning. And after the race, the press converged upon Harry Payne Whitley, and they yelled, Mr. Whitley, Mr. Whitley, Mr. Whitley, how do you feel now that your horse has won the Kentucky Derby? And it's as if, Matt had scripted it. Whitney said, gentlemen, gentlemen, I don't care if my horse ever runs another race. I don't care if my horse ever wins another race. I have just won the greatest race in the world, and I am satisfied. You can imagine what the headlines were the next day. Whitney wins Derby and proclaims, I am satisfied. And that was it. No, that really wasn't it. But that was certainly a good start. And what Matt Wynn would do was spend the next nine years, nine years, trying to make the Kentucky Derby exactly what he meant for it to be. Actually, the purse of the Kentucky Derby at that time was $30,000. What he wanted to do was to raise the purse to $50,000, which was a lot of money, and do something else. He was going to award something everybody wanted, a solid 24 karat gold trophy, the gold trophy. But he wasn't able to do all of that until 1924, 1924. In the meantime, he had bought Latonia. And the first thing he did was to downgrade the Latonia Derby, obviously, because he's going to make the Kentucky Derby the most important thing. And ultimately what's going to happen is after the depression hits, Latonia is going to fall upon hard times and it is suddenly closed in 1939 with no warning whatsoever. But there was a period of time when Churchill Downs owned Latonia. We're going to get more to that in a, in a little bit. And so now, 1924, they're going to run the gold trophy race. And wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be great if there was high drama involved in this 1924 race? The first thing that happened was they opened a new racetrack in Kentucky over in Greenup County called Raceland. And its million-dollar race was able to attract all kinds of people. It only lasted four years, but there was plenty of competition going on. There was competition going on for Latonia as well. There was the Queen City race course down in Newport, which was an irritant more than anything else. There was a course in Rosedale, Kentucky, 
called the Rosedale Electric Light Company, the first lit course at night in America. It lasted one year. But by now, we're ready to run the 1924 Derby, and we need some drama, and we're going to get it. We're going to get it down in Mexico, where a trainer by the name of Hoots, H-O-O-T-S, has an old mayor, a really very serviceable old mayor, by the name of, you see it. And you see it was a good horse, but Hoots didn't have any other good horses. Consequently, he owed his feed bills and several other bills. And so the racing secretary went to him and said, Mr. Hoots, why don't you put Hoots it, or you see it, in a claiming race? And I'll promise you, nobody will claim your horse. You'll win an $800 claiming race. You'll be able to pay your bills and go home and live happily ever after. He went for it. You see it, won the race, and guess what? Somebody claimed the horse. And Hoot said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not going to get my horse. So he loaded the horse. And, of course, the rule is if somebody claimed your horse, you bought it. It's a buy. He loaded the horse in to a horse trailer, and away he went, with first the Mexican police chasing him, then the Texas police chasing him, then the Louisiana police chasing and the Arkansas police, but he finally got home. He got home to Oklahoma because he was married to a Cherokee woman, and he got on the reservation, and once he got on the reservation, the chase is over, and so there he sits with this wonderful old mayor and nothing else, but he's not done yet. He decides to sneak this mayor over to Lexington, Kentucky, to the farm of E.R. Bradley and breed it to the finest stallion in America at the time, a horse by the name of Black Tui. Uh, Bradley has been named all his horses with a B, Black, Bur uh, Burgoo, King, Boiling Over, Behave Yourself, and so on. The breeding took place. The horse went back to Oklahoma and was foaled. Now, there's a legend and a story here. Everybody who told that story in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, said, oh, this unbelievable Indian pony came off the reservation to run to the Kentucky Derby. He wasn't an Indian pony. He was a thoroughbred bred to the best stallion in America and to one of the best mayors in America and was actually the two-year-old champion of 1923. But Hoots was determined to take this horse to that 1924 Derby. And what was the name of the horse? Black Gold. Black Gold. Indian Reservation, oil, black gold. Get it? Okay. He's going there. All of a sudden, however, he becomes very ill. And as he lay on his deathbed, Hoots looked up at his beloved wife, Rosa, and said, if I die, take our horse to the Kentucky Derby and win that gold trophy derby. He died. So they're going to run the race. And here they come, the whole tribe, everybody, with all the pejoratives you could possibly think of, wigwams, squaws, papooses, Indian ponies, the whole deal. And they camp out in the infield at Churchill Downs. And needless to say, WHAS, the boys from Kentuckiana, and the Courier Journal went nuts covering this. And, of course, what's going to happen is Black gold is going to win that gold trophy, 1924 Derby. And frankly, that was the moment in time when the Kentucky Derby became something different, unique, and special. The trophy was awarded and was taken back somewhere. It has never been seen, seen since. I don't know if they buried it, melted it down, or what. But if you find that program in your trunk and you happen to find that gold trophy, we're really going to be in good shape. We'll get to that sometime. So the Kentucky Derby became part of the fabric of American history, partly because of the promotion of the radio, of Bill Corum, of Matt Wynn, and Matt Wynn would stick with it and would live until 1949. And most of you probably are very familiar with the Kentucky Derby glasses. The first glass, of course, came out in 1938. It was a water glass that was served in the clubhouse. And there were only about 600 of them, but people took them home as souvenirs. The great irony of that water glass, if you ever see a picture of it, is it shows a grandstand with three towers, not two, three towers, 
And those are the three towers of old Latonia, not of Churchill Downs. So that's a unique mistake that was made. That glass is worth $6,000 if you find one of those in the trunk, incidentally. And so the Derby evolved. And another part of the Derby story is the rivalry, of course, with other racetracks. Matt Wynn had bought all the racetracks in Kentucky. He had bought Latonia. He had bought another track known as Douglas Park in Louisville. He had bought the association track in Lexington. And of course, he owned Churchill Downs. They made Douglas Park into a training track. They continued using Latonia as long as it made money. And they closed the association track. Now we're in this peculiar position in the early 1930s, the depression years of Lexington having no racetrack. So what are we going to do? We're going to let Louisville dominate? Well, you know better than that. That doesn't happen in Kentucky, i.e. UK and University of Louisville. And so what happens is a man by the name of Jack Keene, he was actually the guy that founded Raceland. Jack Keene volunteered to put together a group of racemen, a guy by the name of Price and a guy by the name of Heedley, and to form a nonprofit, nonprofit racetrack, a nonprofit racetrack. This will be the only nonprofit racetrack in America. The funds that are generated at Keeneland, which opened in 1936 on the Keene farm, are put back into improvements, into charity, into anything they can figure out to do. And many people at Keeneland in the early days were just volunteers. This was the idea was to have a place to race the finest two and three year olds in America. And of course, Keeneland racetrack evolved from 1936 into a special place. Many people believe it's the greatest racetrack in America and there's a good argument to be made there. And years ago, it was just gentility at its height. When a horse won a race, no matter whether you bet on him or not, he came back and paraded before the crowd and they clapped. And they did not call the race for many, many years. And also, you didn't know when the race was going to start till the flag dropped. So there are a lot of things about Keeneland that were quite historic. But I want to continue a little bit the story of the Kentucky Derby. And what I want to say about it is there's something called the Triple Crown. And I'd like to tell you that the Triple Crown is an American invention. It is not. It is an English invention. The term Triple Crown has to do with England. Now, there's Keeneland. What do you get? What else I got there? Now we'll get to him. Let's go backwards. Go back to the map. Keep going. There we are. I'll talk about this horse in just a minute. 1919. They were going to run the Kentucky Derby. And the best horse in North America was owned by a Canadian. His name was Commodore. J.K.L. Ross. Notice it isn't Colonel, as in Kentucky, it's Commodore in Canada. And he had the greatest horse in North America, a horse called Billy Kelly. Nobody could beat Billy Kelly, everybody said. But Billy Kelly had a problem. He had a problem. He liked to run with other horses and on occasion took an ocean and ran ahead. Sound familiar? And so to cure this, Commodore Ross decided to buy a maiden. And he bought a horse that never even been in a race. The horse's name was Sir Barton. And the plan was very simple. Let Sir Barton run as fast as he could, wear the rest of the field out, and let Billy Kelly collect the pieces and win the 1919 Kentucky Derby. I know you're not going to believe this, but nobody told Sir Barton the plan. And he won the race by six lengths. Billy Kelly ran second. Then they shipped him up to Pimlico at Baltimore. And he raced in the Preakness. He won the Preakness to everybody's surprise. Then they shipped him to New York. Now, today, if a horse wins the Kentucky Derby and wins the Preakness, he is pampered and rested and everything is taken care of. They couldn't have cared less. They shipped him up there and entered him into the Withers. He won the Withers. Four days later, he ran in the Belmont. He won the Belmont. Hence, he became the first Triple Crown winner. But we weren't using the term at that time. That term is not developed until the 1930s. 
So he won four great races in a row. But nobody cared much about that because there was another horse, another horse that had developed, a horse that would never race in Kentucky, a horse that would run 21 times and lose only once. He would lose up at Saratoga because in those days, they started horses in a web barrier. and He got tangled up in the barrier and would lose by about a head to a horse aptly named Upset. Sound familiar? When something great in sports happens, it is an upset. In fact, there's all kinds of terminology in racing tied to this. Let's say, for instance, you have a horse that's very fractious and you don't know what to do with him. Well, what you do with him if you're a horseman is put a pet in there with him, a cat or a dog. But by far the best companion for a fractious horse is a goat. But let's say you're going to run against a good horse and he has a goat. Well, what you do is you sneak over there at night and you get his goat. Right. You got it. Okay. This horse's name was Man of War. And there's his groom, Mr. Sweet who said, that's the mostest horses I ever saw. That horse is going to win 20 of the 21 races and be immortalized as the greatest horse ever. And there's a huge debate whether Man of War was better than another horse we'll talk about in a few moments, Secretariat. Man of War is buried, of course, in Kentucky, where he should be. Now, we're getting to the next Triple Crown race. 1930, <clears throat> there was a horse called Gallant Fox, and he would win the Triple Crown, but it wasn't him again that was important. What was important was his trainer. His trainer was the most famous horse trainer in North America. His name was Sonny Jim Fitzsimmons, and everybody was enthralled by the fact that Sonny Jim had trained this great horse. Five years later, a son of this horse, Gallant Fox, would win the Triple Crown. The horse's name was Omaha. Omaha today is buried in Nebraska. He's buried at a racetrack called, the now defunct racetrack, called Exarban. Exarban, that's an unusual name. Is that an Indian name? No, that's not an Indian name. That's Nebraska spelled backwards. Horse people have a sense of humor. Incidentally, as far as Sir Barton was concerned, he was put in a match race against Man of War would be destroyed in 1921, and once that happened, he was sold to the United States Cavalry and stood as a stud mount for $10, and he's buried out in Casper, Wyoming, with a little bitty tombstone out there. So these Triple Crown winners, these first two, were really not all that important, and it was not until 1935 that Omaha was referred to as a Triple Crown winner, a Triple Crown winner. Two years later, a son of Man of War is the best horse in America. His name is War Admiral, War Admiral. And War Admiral is going to win the Triple Crown, but he is going to be put in a match race in 1938 against a horse called Sea Biscuit, And he's going to lose. He is going to lose. And Sea Biscuit, incidentally, ran at Old River Downs ran a Detroit race course for $2,500 claiming. You could have claimed Seabiscuit for $2,500, but he went out to California and became a very fine handicap horse, and he's going to beat this champion quite convincingly at Chemical Race Course. Three years later, the war is on, 1941, and a horse with a deformed hoof is going to come to the Kentucky Derby. The horse is nasty with a capital N. The horse is crazy, absolutely crazy. A local jockey by the name of Eddie Arcaro had ridden the first of five derby winners in 1938, a horse called Larwin. Now he's going to ride for Calumet Stable, the blue and red, devil red of Calumet Stable, and he's going to ride whirl away. Now, Eddie became a good friend of mine, and he told me what happened that day. He said the night before that derby, he walked the track to see all kinds of divots and holes in the track so he knew how to avoid them. And why did he do this? Because Whirlaway was crazy. 
The first race he ever ran, he was broke from the inside gate, went all the way to the far fence and went all the way around the track on the outside there. Still won the race. And Eddie just absolutely didn't know what to do with this horse. The trainer of the horse stopped Eddie out in the paddock before the derby. His name was Jones. And he said, Eddie, let me show you something. And the horse had blinders on, shadow rolls on. And he took out a pen knife and he cut the left eye so the horse could see out of it. And he said, now, Eddie, the reason I'm doing this is I don't want this horse to hit the rail and not know he's hitting the rail. So you do everything you can to keep him off that rail. And Eddie told me, he said, I steered that horse to the right the entire race. He said, I just had to do that or I wasn't going to win. And this horse had a tail that shot up all the time. They called him Mr. Bushy Tail. And if you see the reruns of that race, it's great to watch that tail shoot up into the air. And he's going on to win the Triple Crown. Two years later, Johnny Longdon is going to win on a horse called Count Fleet. He rode with this horse from Illinois after winning the Illinois Derby. And someone said to him after he'd won the Derby and the Preakness, can this horse lose? And Johnny Longdon said, this horse could fall down and he'd still get up and win the race. And he knew what he was talking about because he's going to win the Belmont by 25 lengths. A length is a fifth of a second. So he wins the Belmont by five seconds. Three years later, Eddie Arcaro is going to get yet another Derby winner, his third. And the name of the horse is Citation. Got a picture of him. As I told you, Eddie was a good friend of mine, and there was a little brewery here in northern Kentucky. You know, there it is. It's called Wiedemann's. You might remember Wiedemann's. And this isn't Citation, but it's a picture of Eddie on Hill Gale. And Eddie uh, wrote me, a, inscribed that for me. But Citation is going to win the 1948 Derby. Now, this is a really interesting story. Eddie wasn't scheduled to rise to Citation, even though he was the regular rider for Calumet. The rider's name was Snyder, but he dry, drowned about 10 days before the Derby, and Eddie picked up the mount. Eddie was scheduled to ride Coal Town. And they said, which one do you want to ride, Eddie? And Eddie said, I'll take Citation. And he knew what he was doing, because Citation would win the Derby by six lengths, and Coal Town would run second. That was that story. So the Triple Crown is now part of the mystique of the Kentucky Derby. And where are the Triple Crown winners? There aren't any. From 1948 to 1973, there are no Triple Crown winners. But now we're going to get to the trivia question. Some of you may have looked it up. If you cheated and looked it up, shame, shame, shame on you. But somebody's going to win. There was an agreement between Meadow Stable in Virginia and Claiborne Farm in Kentucky. Claiborne Farm was run by Bull Hancock and Meadow Stable was owned by Christopher Chinnery. His daughter's name was Penny Chinnery Tweedy. And the agreement was every other year, one of the farms got their choice. In this particular year, it was Meadow's turn. And they chose a foal that was foaled in Virginia, a horse that when it was uh, when it appeared, Pity took one look at it and said, that horse is something special. Now, the rule is this. A horse cannot use the same name within the next 15 years. So if someone had used that name within the 15 years of its birth, it couldn't be used. But she said, call it something special. And she went off to Europe. She was a globetrotter. She gets a phone call from her secretary, Elizabeth Ham. She said to Penny, Penny, we can't use that name. It's been used. And Penny says, well, why don't you name it? Well, Elizabeth Ham had been a secretariat for the League of Nations, the League of Nations. And the League of Nations was a secretariat, and that's how the name came about. 1973, the Kentucky Derby, and I was there. Row one, seat one, lower grandstand, right by the starting gate. A horse by the name of Raymond Earl had won the big race at Latonia. He was a speedster. Secretariat had lost to Sham two weeks earlier in the Wood Memorial because he had a cold, congestion of the chest. And I had a friend who asked me, who are you going to bet? I said, are you crazy? I'm going to bet Secretariat. He said, well, I'm going to bet Sham. And I said, you really are crazy. And I talked him out of betting Sham. He bet a lot of money. 
on secretary, as it turned out. I didn't bet as much as I should have, but they set up the race. Raymond Earl starts out in front. He's going gangbusters. And all of a sudden, he gets passed by Sham. Sham is breaking the track record. And on the far turn, he's in the lead. But here comes Secretariat from dead last to catch Sham right in front of me. That's the way I planned it. And down the stretch, they went. And of course, Secretariat would win by two lengths and set the track record, 159 and two. That's still the track record. He would later set the track record in the Pimlico and in the Belmont, which he won by 31 lengths. Show the picture of Secretary. We'll get, no, next one. No, that's Steve Cole. We'll get you. Next one more. There he is, Secretary. Alleged. And the debate goes on and on, which is the best horse. He was uh, at stud at Claiborne Farm and developed hoof laminitis, a hoof disease, and had to be put down. The man that put him down was a Paris veterinarian, a friend of mine. <clears throat> he said it was the hardest thing he ever did in his life. So be it. 1977, Northern Kentucky shows up again. A fellow by the name of Benny Castleman ran a little restaurant here called The White Horse, and it was the place to gather. And Benny bred horses, and he took a horse down to the Keeneland Sales. Don't twitch your nose at the Keeneland Sales. What's the highest ever paid for a horse at the Keeneland Sales? $16 million for the Green Monkey in 2009. Never won a race. So be it. But this particular horse, nobody wanted him. He brought him home. He asked $15,000 at the sales and nobody took it. Got a phone call from a fellow out in West on the West Coast. His name was Hill. He was a veterinarian. He said, I'd like to buy that horse. I'll give you seventeen five for it. Benny, of course, said, sure. Guy bought the horse and named it Seattle Slough. Of course, he would be written by Jean Cruguet, the champion European jockey who is not in the Hall of Fame because they don't like the French jockeys, but he will be someday, I suppose. And he went on to win the Triple Crown. He went on to win the Triple Crown. The next year, a young lad from Walton, Verona, Kentucky, his name is Stephen Mark Cawthon, was the riding sensation of America. And because Lafitte Pinkai, the regular jockey on a horse, was set down, Steve got the horse. The name of the horse was uh, Farmed. Here he is. Come back there. Come back. There he is. There's Steve on a firm. He inherited the horse. Everybody thought the winner that year of the Triple Crown was going to be a Calumet horse, a horse called Ali Dar. And in fact, these horses as two-year-olds had raced against each other. And on four occasions, Alidar had won at greater distance and the firm had won two times. So everybody said, Alidar is the triple crowner this year. I said, no. I said, you're overlooking something. You're overlooking Steve Cawthon. And I was able to wager and do very well on this. And I was right because at the Derby, Alidar got in trouble, got beat by a length and a half. In the Preakness, he was beaten by a head. And in the Belmont, which most people call the greatest race ever run, which is run at a mile and a half, that's 12 furlongs, these two horses hooked one another six furlongs into the race and were neck and neck for the next three quarters of a mile, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Steve did the most amazing thing because he was a great horseman and he is a great horseman. He had never hit a firm left-handed. And he took his whip and switched it over to the left hand and swacked him left-handed. And it was just that little spark, that little jump that jumped him over the finish line ahead of Ali Dar and into immortality. Steve went on to become a champion jockey in Europe, won 37 grade one races, and today has his own farm in uh, Verona, Kentucky, called Dreamfields, where he breeds horses. Well, I'm going to leave some time for people to ask questions, but I want to end with one thing. There was an author by the name of Irving Cobb, who was well known in Kentucky, and then went to New York, was a journalist. And everybody wanted him to talk about the Derby. He refused to do so. But one time he finally said, all right, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it one time. And I know it's going to be in the paper. And he was literate, very literate, just like Bill Corr. He said, gentlemen, 
He said, until you've been to Kentucky and with your own eyes beheld the Kentucky Derby, you ain't never been nowhere and you ain't never seen nothing. 